Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. Thank you all for snapping up tickets for our upcoming Thunder Nerds tour. It's going to be so much fun and so many of you have already got tickets. It has been absolutely staggering to be honest we have sold out a number of the dates there's still quite a lot of tickets available though so do go to no such things fish.com forward slash live to see what tickets are available now but the main reason that i've come here today is to speak directly to the people of sydney australia you of all the people around the world have really pulled out all the stops and helped us to sell out the Sydney Opera House in just a couple of days. Absolute insanity, it has to be said. Uh, but to thank you for doing that, we're going to put on an extra show in Sydney. Now, the details of that will first be told to Club Fish members at the beginning of your next bit of bonus content, which is due to come out on the 11th of June. You people will have a pre-sale and then if there are any tickets left, they will go on sale on the 14th of June and we'll give details at the top of that Friday show. So that's the big news. We're really looking forward to this tour. It's going to be absolutely amazing. If you haven't got tickets yet, then do not dilly dally because they are going super, super fast. And like I said, you can get those at no such thing as a fish .com forward slash live. One more thing to say, and that is that there is a bit of an odd thing about this week's show. Uh, that is that one member of the team was unable to make it to the office on time. Despite leaving home on time, they never made it. Uh, I will leave it up to you to guess who that's going to be. Uh, but what it means is that this was a three person show. Obviously, we very much missed the person in question, uh, but hopefully you will enjoy the show nonetheless. Anyway, no more to say apart from, as we always do every week, on with the podcast! Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Anna Toshinsky, and I'm joined here today by James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray, and a superior replacement to Dan Schreiber <laughs> in the form of, if you're seeing the video clip of this, a puppet of Dan Schreiber, uh, who will say much less, and I think that'll be appreciated. I'm afraid Dan is stuck on a train somewhere in the east of England. Uh, hashtag Broken Britain. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear Broken Britain making a comeback. No one said that yeah. for years. Is that quite dated? We're too busy living it, you know. Um, no, yeah, Dan is, Dan is stuck. This is the first ever, I think, three-person podcast we've ever done. Uh -oh. Yeah. If you prefer the format, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> I think this could be, this could be it. Do this you think? Is, we might I, crack it. I just want to say, Dan, if you're listening, which I know you will be, uh, I really missed you. Mm. James was the first one to suggest. <laughs> he said, let's cut the sandbag loose. He kept saying, kept saying it over and over again. He said that before your train was even delayed, actually. <laughs> we had a whole thread going, how do we ditch Dan? Yeah. So... It was actually me that stopped the train. <laughs> I put five people on the track <laughs> and then one person on another track. <laughs> no, you put one leaf on the line, so we'll be there for a couple of days. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to kick off with fact number one. And because I'm hosting, I've made that my fact. <laughs> my fact this week is that as part of the preparations for D-Day, one scientist persuaded another to inhale oxygen until she vomited. They got married shortly afterwards. Aww. Sort of a weird rom-com in, in a fact. Is it a meat cute Maybe they already knew each other. I don't know what meat cute is. is. That? God, guys, that's in a rom com. The moment where the couple they bump into each other, uh, she drops all her stuff. He helps her. She pick vomits. Up. She vomits. <laughs> they're, they're under the ocean. Maybe is this? Yeah. They're in a hyperbaric chamber. They're simulating me under the ocean. Certainly. Okay. Well, it's the meat. It's the original meat cute. Uh, this is from this amazing book that I need to cite. It's written by someone called Rachel Lance, who is actually a blast injury specialist and a researcher into bodies surviving the extremes of being underwater, but she's written this book called Chamber Divers and she's uncovered this story which is that the D-Day landings hadn't happened yet this is Second World War but uh, there had been a disastrous Canadian beach landing 
um, in the Second World War on the beaches of France and it had been disastrous because oh. they had based it on a bunch of old photos they had, like old holiday photos from the 1920s. <laughs> You're joking. Uh, and they're like, where's the Ferris wheel? <laughs> exactly. Where's all the sunbathers? <laughs> so you've got to make landfall by the donkeys, right? And, that... <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out the donkeys and the Ferris wheel and all of that had been replaced wow. by German guns. Oh, that's um, bad luck. Which is such bad luck. And it was awful and huge number of casualties. Was it that the sand had moved or the tides had moved the sand or that they couldn't land in the same way because of the ocean conditions? I think it was that they couldn't tell what the terrain was like based on the pictures. So they thought it was going to be nice and sandy. It was very rocky. It was very hazardous. Couldn't land properly. Really bad. And so it became apparent that in order to do a successful beach landing uh, to invade the Germans, the Allies would have to know more about the coastline, which would mean divers getting right up to the beach, spending a long time underwater, going deep down, getting up to the beach, then popping up at night and actually figuring out exactly what was on the beach. And to do that, we needed to know how to dive, which we didn't really in the 40s. <laughs> Interesting. You know what I was reading yesterday? I was reading a book about the history of barbed wire. And this is really off topic. <laughs> we'll <see> yeah. <laughs> there was a thing in it how during the war, they used to put barbed wire under the sea. Mm -hmm. So as in when people would come and land, you would jump off the boat and start running up, but you're... Oh my feet would get tangled because there's barbed wire under the sea. No way. Under the sea. Yeah. Under the it's sea. It's not better. <laughs> <laughs> that's mean. It's, it's, that's, yes. what, it was a time of meaning. <laughs> 39 to 45. It was, wasn't it? That's extraordinary. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. But that would be useful for your divers as well because they would notice it, I guess. Yeah. They see it exactly yeah. with the goggles on because they wear goggles, don't they? Yeah. Um, anyway, this is a long-winded way of getting to the point that there were these two researchers, JBS Haldane and Helen Spurway. They worked for UCL and they shut themselves repeatedly in these hyperbaric chambers, chambers that could be filled up with oxygen and simulate underwater pressures. They did this over and over again to find out the effects on the human body so that the D-Day landings could happen. And Helen Spurway is in there and she's the one who's inhaling pure oxygen because it's the other body deals with um, oxygen at high pressures because it can right. be very dangerous. And JBS Haldane is sitting next to her taking notes in this hyperbaric chamber. And she managed to last for 33 minutes on pure oxygen before she tore the breathing tube out of her mouth, vomited repeatedly, hallucinated and said, I'm done, thanks. Well, she might have said, I'm done, thanks. <laughs> because <laughs> I read about what happens to you in those situations. And yeah, your voice goes really high like really? you're on helium. Helium. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. They should do that at a kid's birthday party, shouldn't they? Well, it's kind <laughs> of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of, well, there's a lot of vomiting at kids' birthday parties, <laughs> I say that. Um, it does sound kind of fun, apart from people can't whistle mm. when there's so much oxygen either. Oh, no. So, you know, it's... it's well, I wouldn't like that, because I'm no. a whistler. Are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get told off for whistling from my wife's family well, who think it's bad luck in the house. Well, you're, you're whistling out of the window at passing women, aren't you? <laughs> and, it's, and you've got your hard hat on. I guess. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> it really affected uh, Haldane, didn't it? So I read that in the course of this research, he got a bubble at the base of his spine, which stayed there for the rest of his life, and it made it incredibly painful for him to sit down anywhere. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. no, it was he extremely was, dangerous. He was an incredible guy. J.B.S. Haldane. He was, John yeah. John Burden, Burdon, Sanderson Haldane. He was amazing. I, I was just saying before we started recording this, you, you sometimes you meet someone researching this podcast, and you think, I just want to spend weeks with you. I just, I just want to do a, like a month-long special of the show about this... Mm -hmm. Guy, Andy, he, so, if you spent weeks with him, he'd make you do so much mad stuff that you wouldn't have the guts for, I'm afraid. No, okay, fair enough. But he was constantly experimenting on himself, and his dad was also a really famous scientist who experimented on him, and he did all of this science despite not having a science degree even. He studied maths and then classics. I'm sorry to say, but if you do that, you're going to end up with a bubble on your butt. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the professionals, mate. No, you're right, you're right, you're right. But he was like, he was a geneticist by training. And yet, throughout his life, he was constantly doing crazy experiments. Which were really useful as well. Really yeah. useful, You know, yeah. he really did find out a lot about how the body responds to um, these pressures and different gases. I think he did a lot of research into nitrogen as well. If we get overexposed to nitrogen, he went down. I well, think... When he, was when he was about 13, he was first experimented on undersea by his father. So this is a lifelong <laughs> thing for Haldane, right? He and his father, who, who was called... Um, um, also John John, Hal John, John Scott Haldane, Haldane yeah. John Scott Haldane sorry yeah yeah they went up to the west coast of Scotland on HMS Spanker which was oh, a navy yeah. ship yeah um, do you have a, cap, a hat I do I have a naval cap with the bad HMS Spanker which was an old prop from QI 
And I wear that standing at my window. And I, <laughs> and I also have had complaints. And he was, he and his father was trying to work out the speed divers should rise at to mm. stop getting the bends, the decompression sickness. Mm. And they didn't know what caused that. And he found exactly. out basically. Yeah. And yeah. Haldane Senior put his volunteers, including his 13 year old son, Jack, Amazing. in a badly fitting diving suit, got them to repeatedly go down into the sea and then come back up at different speeds. He did work out eventually how to come back up. But Jack Jr. became incredibly cold and frightened. He was 13 years old. And his dad just apparently dosed him with lots of whiskey and then put him to bed. And that, and that, was, that was parenting in the Edwardian. Like, and yeah. now we look back and think, what a legend. <laughs> it would be child abuse. That's true. <laughs> because actually yeah. it was him and Naomi, his sister. And uh, she was a sort of equally amazing character. So she was four years younger than JBS Haldane and their dad experimented on both of them constantly. <laughs> Apparently Naomi's job as a child from literally the age of three was to monitor test subjects through an observation window in these gas chambers that he'd set up. <laughs> Make sure your brother's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally that if they fell unconscious, she had to drag them out and resuscitate them. Jesus. Honestly, I'm starting to warm a little less to this guy. I have to say. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm just imagining what a genius he would have been in adult life, Haldane, had he not had his brain squashed by <laughs> gases every weekend. Maybe it was that's the equivalent of the bonk on the head, though. Maybe that was what yeah. sparked the genius. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, maybe. Maybe we should all be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, he spent, it... his, he spent his whole life being gassed, I've just realised. He was gassed in the First World War as well. His entire was he? life. He was, yeah, yeah. So he was in uh, the Black Watch. And the Black Watch are a very sort of famous uh, Scotch regiment. You know, they sort of like... Legends of the British Army. They all wore a black watch, didn't they? That's right. And Cassio. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they never started their attacks on time, because they'd all drifted a little bit. One, two, three. <laughs> beep! <laughs> Let's go! The Germans just open the machine gun fire as soon as they hear this huge beep. Um, and they, so his job was trench mortar officer, so he had to lead groups to throw bombs by hand into enemy trenches. I mean, it's quite fierce and hard and horrible work. Yeah. He loved it. And he was gassed, which sparked an interest in mustard gas and experimenting on that. But while he was at the front, I love this, he was writing back and forth with Naomi, his sister, about mouse genetics. And he later, he boasted he was the only officer to complete a scientific paper from a forward position of the Black Watch. No way. way. That's amazing. It is amazing. amazing. But he must have been like, the gas comes towards him. He must be like getting a Madeleine moment of his childhood, <laughs> mustn't he? <laughs> He's like, oh, this reminds me of old dad. <laughs> He's taking off his mask, mate, getting his notepad out. <laughs> oh my uh, God. Can we talk about Helen Spurway? Yeah, oh, yeah, she was also so, uh, awesome. This is... She was the other one in the diving experience. She was right? the who one should... who vomited. Yes, vomited, and who sorry. he did marry, um, as right. they did yeah, mention, yeah. after vomiting all over him. Um, they did get married afterwards. Go on. She reminds me a bit of Erica McAllister mm. because Bug she, her, most of her research was on drosophilia, fruit flies. Yes. So she mm. was... An, world expert on fruit flies, mm -hmm. basically. And then she later wrote a paper about parthenogenesis in guppies, in the fish. So that means that a female guppy can give birth without virgin, having sex. Virgin birth. Mm -hmm. Virgin birth. But she also said that possibly it could happen in humans because of her work in guppies. Mm -hmm. She was like, well, there's no reason if it happens in guppies, it can't happen in puppies and then in humans. <laughs> guppies, um, puppies, humans. The obvious <laughs> progression. Yuppies. <laughs> she was extremely hardcore as well, wasn't she? As you'd have to be. They sort of found each other's soulmates in each other. And she was quite a strange character. Um, so there's a Time magazine report of an incident that happened to her in 1956, which, you have to bear in mind, it is 1956. It began, Britain's blonde biologist, Helen Spurway Haldane, yep. wife of brilliant biologist, JBS <laughs> Haldane. Yeah. The blonde and the brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, emerged from a London pub after downing three and a half pints of bitter and encountered a bobby, stamped on his police dog's tail and clouted the cop. So she was clearly a bit feisty. Maybe she was just experimenting what would happen if a dog got yeah. its tail stomped on. Maybe she was. Well, the answer, it turns <laughs> out, is you end up in prison for two months. Yeah. Two months? Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, but she was offered Fair to enough. pay a fine and she said, no, not up for it. And she was about to go to India and she said, I'll fit in much better with some of the other people who've gone to India if I've done a prison well, spell. Well, basically, that's oh. why they left Britain. So Haldane was at Cambridge and she got arrested for drunk and disorderly. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, let's just go to India then. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but whenever anyone asked him why, he said, oh, um, the Suez crisis, I think the government has handled that so badly that yeah. I want to leave the UK and I want to go to India. But it's actually because his wife was a pisshead. <laughs> <That's extra> <laughs> 
Because I read that I read a few reasons that he gave. One was that he was broke as well. Like after the war, his lab had no money, and he was broke. And those and he, pints are bitter, don't no. cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be given a really good job offer from the Indian Statistical Institute. But also, he then claimed this is a bit more in the Suez line of things that he just didn't want to wear socks anymore. <laughs> he said, 60 years in socks is enough." Right. So I'm moving to India. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you, you know, don't like have that. to wear socks. Well, also, one thing he really liked, apart from the nice job offer and, you know, the culture and all that, he liked the socialism there. Because they had a lot of socialism in India at the time. Yeah. And he was a former communist. He spent years and years in the Communist Party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, slightly embarrassed himself a bit over Lysenko, who was the mm. dodgy Soviet pseudoscientist who claimed he was going to revolutionise crops. And, well, and yeah, did. that's oh. the thing. Like Lysenko, he was the one who said Darwin's theories are not completely correct. Yeah. But obviously for Haldane, this is a big problem because he was such a geneticist and he was so... That's weird. Know. Like for him, like to be a world expert on genetics, yeah. for a while he was kind of saying, well, then, you know, there might be something in it. And he slightly compromised his scientific principles. Naomi was also a socialist. Mm. Oh, was she? Okay. And committed socialist. But anyway, <laughs> she also proofread Lord of the Rings. In her spare time. Get out. Did she actually, in fact, wrote over 90 novels. She was incredibly... I thought you were going to say incredibly... over 90% of it. <laughs> <laughs> the great, undervalued wow. woman. Yeah. She God. proofread it. Yeah. Could she not have got him to kind of pare it down a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> it was actually 19 books long before she edited it. No, if she wrote 90 books, she's not a master of concision. No. <laughs> no. Um, Haldane's first wife, Charlotte Franken, was a daughter of an alien. Oh, yeah. Go on. Yeah. Dan? <laughs> no response from Dan there? No, he's just sat there. Okay. He's stunned. You've stolen his only fact. Um, her father was Jewish and the son of a German. And during the First World War, there was a thing called the Alien Restrictions Act. If you personally wasn't a British citizen, then they would you would have less rights than anyone else in okay. the country. Uh, so he decided to leave and left Charlotte on her own. But she became a reporter for the Daily Express, apparently because, and this is according to the Dictionary of National Biography, because her father had taught her to drink like a man. <laughs> <laughs> so that helped her to become a reporter for the Express. I believe it. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. pretty much the only qualification you needed. But she was actually married when she met Haldane and she got divorced and the divorce quoted Haldane as a person in the divorce. And oh. he basically got fired from Cambridge because of that. As in, he was quoted as a person she'd been um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shagging. monkeying about with. Exactly. He was, Cambridge was very uptight back I in those days, wasn't it? He was brought up in front of the sex viri. The what? The sex viri. <laughs> viri? Viri. V I R I. What are they? Well, sex. Six men. Six men, yeah. yeah. So oh. they were the moral guardians of the University of Cambridge, which, if you'd done anything wrong, you would be brought up in front of them and they say, You're going to lose your position in wow. the university. Wow, sex very. Sex very. Mm -hmm. that, that must have led to some confusion. People turning up for a good time, <laughs> seeing, the, seeing the plaque on the door. Well, Haldane, he contested the charge. He won. He started calling the sex very the sex weary. Brilliant. That's a bit of a joke. Brilliant. And they basically lost all of their um, authority and, wow. and they weren't there anymore. Not, so, thanks, not thanks solely to that. No, but it was pun. really part of it. Really? Uh, not the, well, the pun, but all <laughs> the whole yeah, you know, escapade yeah, yeah. was part of it, yeah. Wow. Of course, if you are speaking classical Latin the way it's traditionally spoken, it's pronounced sex-weary anyway, isn't it? So, oh, maybe it's an even better joke. Even better back in those days. <laughs> That's great. Latin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's time for fact number two, and that is Andy. My fact is that the Swiss have a special kind of wrestling trouser named the Schwingerhosen, with a special belt for your opponent to hang on to. Why does your <laughs> opponent want to hang on to your trousers? <laughs> well, the, sh the Schwinghosen are these, these heavy trunks that you wear in the Alps when you're wrestling with your fellow farmers and loggers and herdsmen and all of that it's um <laughs> traditionally oh it's quite a blokey sport traditionally uh there are also it's been making strides uh, there are some lady swingers now but it, <laughs> traditionally it was yeah, a, a, it was a lad's occupation and um basically you put your right hand on um your opponent's belt your left hand on their right leg you brace i'm sure uh and then you tussle and um, you're trying to <laughs> make your opponent vulnerable to the schwunger mm -hmm. uh the schwunger which are the holds there are dozens of holds the average schwinger masters several schwunger 
um, three or four, but they'll know loads. But like you have your three or four signature yeah, moves. Yeah. It's kind of like Street Fighter, the arcade game. Oh, um, yeah. And once you enact a schwunger, your opponent might go for a gegenschwunger, which is a counter hold. And um, oh, I see. Yeah, and, and you like, get points for the holds that you make, or I think you just get points for throwing your opponent or moving them. Maybe it's moving them. I out think of it's the zone. I think it's just throwing them on the floor. That seems to be the yeah. aim. Yeah. And okay. it does. Yeah. If you watch videos, it's very crotch heavy a lot of the time because yep. if you imagine you've grabbed someone's belt loops from behind mm -hmm. and you sort of a lot of the time just shoving them towards you aren't they as they're doing the same i see so you're sort of crotch on crotch quite a lot of the time and then eventually one of you flips the other onto the ground and you've won the bout yeah yeah, yeah. amazing and the um the competitions are often known as swing fests yeah um but don't get them mistaken with the south london swing fest which is a celebration of swing music <laughs> the sussex swing fest which is a golf competition <laughs> or Swing Fest, a swinger only festival from East Yorkshire. <laughs> Is that swinging, swinging? Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's so gosh. don't get mixed up with any of those if you want to go for your homoerotic Swiss wrestling competition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leather trousers would be useful. I think they'd probably be useful for a few of those. For all of those, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Absolutely. <laughs> there should um, be one of those um, flow charts in a magazine. Which swing fest are you? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you That's have great. leather trousers? <laughs> that doesn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I read a great article in the German language press about Paul Eggiman, who's a master saddler, and he makes the wrestling trousers. And um, he's one one of, I think, a handful of people who now truly knows the art of how to make Schwingerhosen. Mm. <laughs> and did you read it in German? No, I, I clicked the button that said... I, oh, I toggle from German to English. Oh, right. Yeah, I yeah, always yeah. do that as well. For, oh, even yeah. for languages that I can speak. It's like, oh. Even for English, you toggle. <laughs> <laughs> More English, please. More Englishy. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and as, there's a quite a nice thing at the end where it's a sort of respectful thing. At the end, the winner ends the match by brushing the sawdust off the loser's back. Oh, yeah. Uh, what well, really? do you think that used to be? <laughs> that he brushed off his back? <laughs> He's going to get a tissue. Come on. <laughs> oh, dear. It's huge though, isn't it? I mean, it's. Yeah, it is, uh, I think it's Schwingen. one of the most well-attended sports in Switzerland, if not the most. About three hundred thousand people Get attend out. the finals, which happen every year to crown the king of the swingers. <laughs> Brilliant. The swinger, <laughs> the jungle VIP. <laughs> <laughs> there was a magazine called Schwinger Zeitung magazine, um, which the first edition was in 1907. And in that edition, they um, talk about bets being placed in taverns mm. on swinging. But it's also, it's amazing. There's a big article about how terrible cycling is. It's okay. <laughs> it's when so was weird. This? 1907. Really? But yeah, it's I guess so that's weird. when it was taking off, you know, yeah. so that will be a... And people were, were quite anti. Um, they yeah. were anti women cycling, especially. Why were they, why did they yeah. think it was bad? Well, because it was an imported sport, I see. Uh, and yep. compared to shringing, which obviously all normal, upstanding Swiss people love to do, cycling uh, involves wretched hunchback figures on their velocipedes. If you right. can't you can't commute to work by swinging, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Swing your way to work. If you and another swinger grab each other and then throw yourselves off the mountain, you can get down to your office in a kind of wheel formation. Yeah. So you are the bike, basically. Yeah. Um, it's one of the three Swiss national sports, or often cited as one of the three really traditional Swiss national sports. And the other two can being... We, can we guess? Swiss national sports. I skiing. doubt it, but give it a go. Um, skiing. It's a no from me. Um, oh, cow, cow riding. You've got to put a cow you've got to put riding. a bell around the a bell, around the neck of the biggest bull in the valley. I uh, think you know that's not a terrible guess. I Blowing like that it. massive horn, that big alpine oh, yeah. horn thing. Oh yeah, the Alp, alpen alpen horning. Oh yodeling. Uh, none of the, I don't think that's a sport. Are we calling that a sport? No, I'm going to tell Eating you. Eating Toblerone. <laughs> You'll kick yourself. Uh, making um, knives. Anonymised bank accounts. Um, <laughs> protecting the Pope. <laughs> yes. I'm going to tell you if that's all right. So, um, <laughs> Dan, anything? <laughs> oh, Dan, what was that you said, Dan? Stein's tossing and Hornusen. Yeah, oh, you're absolutely right, hey, Dan. Did I not say Hornusen? <laughs> Did you say horn, Newson? Well, I said horn. It has nothing to do with horns. Oh. I think it's like a giant. I've watched a bit of it. It's really fun. It's like fly swatting, but on a giant scale. And it's a bit like golf. Someone swings this whip at the horn noose, which is a hornet. Oh, for a hornet. I've seen it. It's like Pretty a cool. golf club, but it's like got a whip bit on the end. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. It's like if your golf club, if you had a trick golf club that was flexible and you hit it. So what, what am I hitting it at? You're hitting it at this massive field in front of you or slope and up the slope are the opponents and they're all holding these huge flapping bats that look like giant fly swats and their job is to swat your ball out of the air. 
and you've got to see um it sounds incredibly difficult wait so i'm i'm whipping my ball into the air yeah and they're trying to swat my ball out so of imagine the air. i hit a golf ball to you you're yep. 200 yards away yeah and you've got a tennis racket yeah and you're trying to hit the golf ball before it lands right but with additional difficulties and you're trying to get it what past me or I'm, you're trying to get it to hit the ground before someone swats it right yeah. okay okay it's such a pretty basic concept it's the kind of game you come up with as a seven-year-old with your sibling and they've stuck with it and it's huge um oh. and in fact uh rudolf minger who i'm sure you guys know was a 1950s swiss politician um... dan no please <laughs> come on mate it's just a name it's not funny it's not a funny name it's just a name <laughs> He said it was the ultimate mark of uh, patriotism alongside wrestling and yodeling. Oh. Can I tell you a thing or two about leather Please. trousers? Sure. Did we talk ever about the ale connor? Uh, I don't think I don't, I don't so. Know. So basically, this was this idea that in the old days, the way you tested beer was that you'd go to a pub, you'd pour the beer onto a wooden bench, and then you'd sit down and you'd see if you stuck to it, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this is a myth. It's a complete myth. Is it really? Yeah. It's from 1911. How, how interesting. From I the, yeah. It's real. It's from this book, Inns, Ales and Drinking Customs of Old England. So it already sounds like copper bottom nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was <laughs> that like um, a publican might put extra sugar in or something exactly. like that. And it would make it sticky. And Yeah. yeah. If you, so, you, so you'd come in wearing your leather trousers. You'd, sit, you'd get some beer, pour it on your bench, sit down. And then you'd sit there for half an hour and try and stand up. And if you stuck to it, it had too much sugar in yeah. and it was impure. Um, if, you st if the bench came up with your ass as you stood up, then <laughs> that's treacle. And they would walk out with the bench stuck on their ass, <laughs> and they'd take your plaque to show you were licensed with them as they went. And it's how hooey. interesting that that's there not true. There were ale conners, but they tasted. There are no contemporary sources on the time saying they sat in a pint. Makes because, sense. Like it, any, because if it's got sugar in it, you would be able to taste it, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's like, that's just, the test. Yeah, Dave, yeah. Dave, why are you pouring it on the... No, no, this is how I do it. But no, it just tastes really sweet. It tastes like honey. No, no, I'm going to sit on it for half an hour. Is this my tea or yours? No, has it got sugar in it? Sit uh. on it and see. <laughs> You've never had that exchange, have you? No. <laughs> and if the nail was strong enough, it could make something stick to a table. Like, it's sticky. Yeah. It's, um, that's brilliant. That's a exploding of a very niche QI myth which yeah, is something we yeah, specialise yeah. in Absolutely. Yeah. I tried to find something interesting out about Theresa May's leather trousers Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, which for international listeners who don't keep a Hawkeye on British news uh, Theresa May, former Prime Minister um, wore some leather trousers famously in a photo shoot in 2016 and got in huge trouble for it it's probably why she had to leave um, because yeah. it was revealed that they'd cost £995 and also they were just <laughs> well, noticeably that... leather trousers. Yeah, and that was worth a lot more before Brexit as yeah. well. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and did you find anything? It was a very hard. Um, they're designed... All I found out was that <laughs> she really didn't want to wear them. Um, oh, and it was the director of communications, Fiona Hill who you may uh, well remember, who insisted that Amanda Wakely, the designer, send a van full of clothes to Downing Street and sort of squeaked her into these leather trousers. Um, I'm Jesus imagining like that Christ. scene in Ross, Ross from Friends when he has to sort of put pat flour down his legs. Um, and yes, wow. her other director of comms, Katy Perry, said she didn't even like the bloody trousers. They were the wrong kind of brown, if you know what I mean, which I don't. No. <laughs> But it was it was quite mad because Cameron did um, habitually wear and other um, male leaders do habitually wear things that cost three thousand five hundred. So when everyone was yeah. demanding oh, well, that she declare it, you know, have yeah, you yeah. declared this on your register of interest? I imagine Rishi stuff. Sunak's wife fronts cost more than that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> are they leather? Let's put in a freedom of information request and find out. <laughs> <laughs> he's at the press conference he's answered all the big questions he comes to uh, yeah um, no such thing as a fish yet do you? <laughs> that would be amazing if we could get into those junkets oh my god oh, we've got to do that how do you get into those junkets come on you drink first oh. the Lederhosen has been banned from time to time in Germany, uh, the church banned it during the 19th century revival of Lederhosen. What? Uh, and in 1913, the Munich Archbishop declared Lederhosen immoral. Uh, and they've got a Lederhosen scene in Peru as well. Okay. There's this tiny bit of Peru, this village called Pozuzu, between the Andes and the Amazon, and it was set up by Austrian and German emigrants, mm. led by a priest called Joseph Egg. Oh, yeah. Um, Hang on, you had another egg earlier. Yeah, you did. Did I? Yeah, yeah. In, an egg name. Oh, in your it? German article that you'd um, got Google to translate for Oh, you, yeah, Paul Eggyman, the master saddler. <laughs> I am the Eggyman. <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah. And anyway, they, so they, every year they have Poz, Pozuzo Fest. Which... So these um, Germans went over to South America, did they? Yes. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we said in the previous episode, when? A <laughs> hundred years before <laughs> okay. Okay. the unpleasantness. Um, <laughs> although King Edward VIII wore lederhosen on his honeymoon with Wallace Simpson, where he went and met Hitler. Did, did he? he? Yeah, that was a, on their honeymoon, they went off and had a meeting with Hitler. It's yeah. very romantic, isn't it? It's every girl's dream. Fo- <laughs> yeah, foe of the podcast. Um, <laughs> they went to the yeah, Eagle's Nest, which is that, you know, it's, it's called Berchtesgaden. It's sort of Hitler's very high mountain alpine retreat. It does sound like a bit of a glamping situation. Maybe uh, she uh, <laughs> thought when he said, we're going to the Eagle's Nest. I found it on Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't quite realise. Aryan b and b Okay, it's time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1963, a fire at the Curry Building was put out by a man called Bum Farto. <laughs> it was also started by him, though, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he was just setting fire to his fartos. And no, um, this is a fact about Key West mm. in Florida. And city? What, um, yeah, it's a city. Yeah, yeah, it's the southernmost city in mainland is it? America. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I think so yeah, I think it's, it's probably still mainland. Up. I know because is it right at the tip of the Florida Keys? It yeah. is. You know what? The Keys. You can drive there, so it's kind of mainland. But the truth is, there's lots of bridges because the Keys are so close together. So they've, br- they they've bridged islands, all the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've yeah, never yeah. been there. It sounds like an amazing bit of the world. It's like, great. It's, it's really extraordinary. Good. Let us yeah, talk yeah. about it in a bit because it's so we've got so bum farto bum farto <laughs> yeah. bum farto was a major figure in 1960s <laughs> key west because he was a fire chief okay um and he was a friend i believe of julio de Pou, who was one <laughs> of the on. main surgeons in the town but i thought his name was marginally funnier so <laughs> we would talk about him uh but he was really good and uh, the reason i came across him actually is because there is a musical that's been written about him called bum farto the musical and it was written by pamela stevenson oh wow. yeah uh, who's billy Connolly's wife yeah, yeah. And, and a writer a, and a, she's a shrink and yeah. uh and a comedian and she's a long to... route from sort of rogers and hammerstein hasn't it <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> we've really run out of all the evidence we've done hamilton and we've done lots of other like key figures in <laughs> yeah. american history <laughs> so um he was the fire chief he wore red suits drove around in a lime green ford galaxy uh, which had a yoruba shrine on its hood uh, Yoruba, as in the Nigerian um, oh, religion. Yeah. Religion, yes. He was yeah. a practitioner, wasn't he? Yeah. Of the Yoruba religion. He called himself El Jefe. Mm-hmm. Uh, or and... El Jeff, if you want to give it this anglicised <laughs> pronunciation, <laughs> which is more funny. Okay. Is that the yeah. chief. The chief, yes. yes. Okay. I think uh, he painted that on his car, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he, he had a license plate that said El Jeff. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> he eventually got done for selling drugs out of the fire department. That is tragic. Can I just ask about the Curry Factory fire? Oh, Do we know yeah, anything yeah. else about that? Yeah, I can tell you that it was owned by Mr. Curry, um, whose oh. name have I written it down? So he, he didn't make curry? Or did he no. happen to be called Mr. Curry, but it was a curry factory as well? No, 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 it wasn't a factory. It was Curry Building. Oh. Uh, and he was Mr. Curry, and he was the first millionaire in Florida, and he was a wrecker. So a big thing in Key West back in the day is you would have people sort of sat on big towers and whenever a ship went past, if it wrecked, they would go, wreck a high, wreck a high. And mm. all the men would run out and try and get at the wreck. And then it was just like finders keepers. It was just finders keepers. And then they would oh. have a big auction in Key West every month where no. they would sell everything that they got from the wreck. It's very bad behaviour wrecking. Well, it's, ba- oh, it's well, bad behaviour when you put the light up and you lure a ship onto the rocks. I think actually most of that is relatively mythical. That's rare, isn't I it? Think. It's sort of, and I, I think that's... That's, that's really, really different. That's like the difference between murdering someone and pickpocketing a dead body. Yeah, and absolutely. I think one and is much worse <laughs> than the other. Anna is really clear about the difference between those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Wrecking is is sort of different to... Yeah. yeah I think yeah. that's all... The myths about that are in Cornwall, aren't they? And yeah, like... but no, no, the myths are the same in Key West, oh, really? actually. Yeah, basically... In fact, 
fact, if you read about wrecking in Cornwall and wrecking in Key West, it's all the same stories. Oh, it's so the funny. same myths. It's the same, you know. Because it must be quite hard to mimic a lighthouse accurately if you don't have a lighthouse. I Do you know so. what I mean? Like, I've got a pretty good Halloween costume, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Yeah, just going around flashing people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, as a former subscriber to Lamp Magazine, I can assure you that I've done my reading on this. Sub- anyway, so can we say why Farto was called Farto? Mm, he, sorry, yeah, why he yeah. was called Bum? Because yeah, Fato was his actual name. Fato was his name. And his first name, his birth name was Joseph Fato. And yeah. his parents probably thought, well, you know, it's an unfortunate surname, but at least it can't get any worse. <laughs> and then he loved fire from a young age and he was always hanging around the fire station. Yeah. And he was known as the little bum. The American version meaning tramp, you know, yeah. or uh, one friend reported that he was always bumming things, which again uh, yeah. shows the difference between American and British English where he... he... Oh, I don't know. You would say, can I bum a cigarette? Yeah. yeah. And he disappeared, didn't he? he In the did, end, yeah. he vanished and he was never found. He's somewhere with Lord Lucan and Elvis. And Shergar, yeah. And yeah. Shergar <laughs> at the party of the century. Because he was flogging drugs. Yes. Mm. And he got caught because he tried to sell it to an undercover police officer. And then they arrested him. And then he was out on bail and they thought that probably he would go out to prison for a long, 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 long time. Or perhaps he would dob in the people who gave him the Mm. gear in Mm. the first place right? uh, because he had connections with Cuba. Um, So then he disappeared. Maybe he drove off and started a new life. Maybe the people who didn't want him to dob them in. Might have done him in. Dobbed him off. And there was a lot of stuff like that going on. I mean, it was a very shady, gang-heavy world. And in fact, the person who dobbed him in, who basically told this undercover agent to go and set him up, was a guy called Titus Rudolph Walters. And he convinced the undercover agent, who was a guy called Larry Dollar, I quite like Larry, um, Larry, Larry Dollar. Larry oh, everyone Dollar. in the story has a great name. Well, Titus Walters is a good name. It's really Larry good. Dollar. But um, Titus, before the deal even happened, where Farto was set up by Larry Dollar, <laughs> Titus, who dobbed him in, was brutally murdered. And I ended up reading this description oh, of no. his murder, and it was extraordinary. He was like the Rasputin of his time. He was. Um, murdered by, you know, other gang people who shot him in the head multiple times. He just wouldn't die. He was, like, crawling out of the bathroom. Eventually, they had to inject him with heroin and drain cleaner to kill him off. Lorks. Mm. Were you just reading it to make sure that somebody had been through his pockets? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. but a few good things that Fato did Mm -hmm. uh, when he was fire chief. He installed a system where, which turned all the traffic lights near the fire station on green with a push of a button. That's fantastic. No, that sounds that incredibly idea. dangerous. Wait, all of them or the no. ones? <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> all of the ones that he needed to go th- to to get to the main road. That's brilliant. There's Activate, only like one yeah. main road in Right, okay. West, really. well, that's really clever. That's a really good idea. Yeah, well, I he did, did it. I bet he used it a bit nefariously sometimes. You He's reckon? late for a date. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do modern fire engines have that capacity? I turn. don't think so. I think they just turn the sirens and go through red lights, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. As far yeah, as I've yeah. seen. But um, he also had a hotline uh, to his home phone that required no dialing. So if he was at home and there was a fire, someone could just press one button like the bat phone. Cool. The Farto phone. <laughs> <laughs> the Farto phone is a completely different prank toy. <laughs> Instead of a spotlight into the sky, it's just they play the noise of a huge guff over Key West. <laughs> oh, no, he hears it. He stops flogging cocaine to a student. And, uh, I must go. He runs into a phone box and he pulls on the Farto costume. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, do you know what? He would be 104 years old now. And part of me does hope maybe he's still out there somewhere. Oh, me too. Right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's Listening a weird... to this show. <laughs> <laughs> There's a weird coincidence about him, or just like a weird collision of histories, where his parents owned a restaurant in Key West, which was called Victoria, and they sold it to a guy called Joe Russell, who was mates with Ernest Hemingway, who'd mm. recently come from Cuba. So Ernest Hemingway has come from Cuba. He visits this restaurant uh, that's just been sold by Bum Farto's family. Right. And he says... You know what? You should call this place Sloppy Joe's because that's the name of a place that I used to go to oh. in Havana. And that is now incredibly iconic. Is that Sloppy still? Joe's. I've been there. 
And have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've eaten a sloppy jerk. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. That was name suggested by Ernest no. Hemingway. And it's this iconic bar. And in fact, once it changed um, lodgings because the rents were massively increased. And so it moved across the road. But the bar never closed when it moved. The people just picked up their drinks oh, as they good. moved venue and walked across the road <laughs> as they moved the sign. Good. That's brilliant. That's commitment to your, to your customers. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. There's a it, few other good things that Fato did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just quickly say. So um, he ordered the replacement of all foam mattresses in the jails because <laughs> if there was a fire, he knew they would release cyanide. Oh. So they were really dangerous. Oh, wow. So he got rid of all the foam mattresses. And obviously the irony of that is the likelihood was that he would have ended up on one of these mattresses. Yeah. You know, mm. when he got arrested. See, if it had been Haldane, Haldane would have <laughs> delighted in <laughs> setting fire to one of the mattresses while he lay on it. Delicious cyanide. <laughs> uh, and the other thing was that he was like the unofficial welcome for Cuban exiles. So a lot of people were leaving Cuba at the time yeah. uh, because Castro had just come in, right? So he would provide food and accommodation just for the first couple of days nice. when you arrived in Key West and then oh. maybe even sort you out with a job and stuff like that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's very close. In fact, I think, is it closer to Cuba than it is to Miami? It's I close. To, it's a hop, skip, and a jump. Harder, harder to drive, I can say that much. <laughs> You'd need a sort of subterranean Haldane designed car, yeah. yeah. The road down that you drove along, James, it used to be a train. Yeah, you can see it, actually. That's cool. I think there are still some bits of railway, I yeah. think. I think it's, so. It was called Flagler's Folly. Because huh. it was Henry Flagler who was a millionaire and he, he he had this vision of a railway all the way down to Key West, all the way through the Florida Keys, yeah. all the bridges that you drive over now. Mm. And it was his life's work. It took $50 million of his money. It nearly killed him. He finally saw it open the year before he died. And he was, in fact, he was tragically, he had gone blind by then. He was in his 80s by the time it opened. And, you know, he, he couldn't see the, his life's achievement, but he could hear as he arrived on the train in Key West, the children of Key West cheering as wow. as he stepped off the train and oh, he wow. he was weeping in uh, uh, emotion at this amazing achievement. Did you know the um I'd learned something about Miami which I didn't know which I thought was mm. very interesting in the course of this. So the only reason he could bring the railroad down to Florida Keys all the way down was because it had extended down to Miami. But there was a woman called Julia Tuttle who lived on what became <laughs> Miami in the 1890s. And she really wanted to um, improve her business standing. So she owned a few hundred acres of land. She wanted the railroad to come down there because obviously that's very useful commercially. Yeah. And she wrote to him saying, bring your railway down here, bring it down here. And he said, no, can't be bothered. That's she way invented too far. Disneyland. <laughs> she, oh, damn, she's not quite that cool. But she did, the story goes, send him during the Great Frost of 1894 some flowering orange blossom from south in Miami ah. saying, look, our fields are so fertile, even though it's so cold, that uh, it's a great place yeah, to you know, yeah. set up shop. And he eventually was persuaded to build the railway down there. And therefore, Miami is the only city of any note in America founded by a woman. So she's, oh. she's the founder of Miami. I did not know, know that. No, hmm. but she didn't make Disneyland. So what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> I read this website. I've got to say, it was, it was fun facts about Key West. Look. Just judge for yourselves. At one point, about 10% of Key West's population was chickens. Okay. Okay, okay that's They've got wild right. chickens. All right, well, all right, here's another I one. I want to know what population they're counting. Are they counting the insects? Because when they're saying 10% <laughs> of its population... You've got a good point. They're covering yeah. all animals. At you can't just include humans and chickens. You can't. So no. the, ba the bacteriophages. <laughs> what about them? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, here, here, all right, I've got two more fun facts from this same website for you. Key West was a major hub for salt production in the 1800s. Okay. That is fun. I'm feeling oh, the fun. it's near the sea. Yeah, I guess. I'm feeling the fun draining away a bit. All right, here's, here's the nail in the coffin. Key West is home to the largest historical district of wooden structures on the US Department of the Interior's National Register of Historic Places. Wow. Dan, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> the sad thing is, I know how excited you are about that fact, Andy. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's mega. Yeah. Well, a lot of the wooden structures would have been lookouts for wreckers. Oh, as well because cool. they built this i think there are some that are still there although they might be reproductions but they're just like if you can imagine like a 30 foot building but it's just like slats of wood almost like oh. in the shape of a lighthouse i'm but thinking of like, an umpire's chair yeah yeah, 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 yeah. like a bigger like version that. of that like that but with a big sort of flat top which you can stand on that's cool Although they do have one of those in Low Sugarloaf Key, which is one of the Florida Keys, which isn't one of those. Uh, it is a similar looking structure, but it used to be filled with ground up female bat genitals. 
Um, this uh, firstly grim, and second, <laughs> sorry, just want to say that. Secondly, is it to lure in male bats? Is it a bat trap? Oh my god, you've got it. Andy's got it. And why do you want a bat trap? Uh, you got too many bats. No, no, you, you want more you bats. Want, you want more? Ah, oh, you're a bat farmer. Um, no, there's a mosquito problem. There was a mosquito problem uh... in the 1920s. So a chap called Richard Clyde Percy read a book about how to get bats to kill mosquitoes, wrote to the guy who wrote the book, said, how do I do this? And he said, build a tower, fill it with ground up female bat genitals. <laughs> what do they have to be ground up? <laughs> why can't just, why can't, what, can you just put female bats in the tower? Would that, you uh, know? You've got to have the ground up. Maybe, maybe it's I easier just, to source ground up genitals. That's so weird. Like, just, without being ground up, the female bats can maybe fly away. Whereas in this way, when they're ground, they're generally ground the whole up. Bat, you've, I presume you've killed the whole bat, and you've I you've so, had to yes. take, yeah. and you've had to. But why not just grind up the whole? Is it to lure male bats? Yes, and the male bats come and they eat all the mosquitoes. So it's only the male bats that eat the mosquitoes. Is no, I it? think just that's I mean, the, the only way you can the, lure bats. Yeah, the males male are probably bats. more likely to be like, well, I can smell female genitals. They might be not attached to a bat anymore or ground up, but beggars can't be oh, choosers. Okay, right. <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> Okay, it's time for our final fact, and that is dance facts. <laughs> Should we um, get him to send it as a voicemail? And I'll play it in. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. Let's do that now. My fact this week is that for over two decades, the actors Grace Kelly and Alec Guinness secretly hid a tomahawk in each other's hotel rooms around the world. Wow, well, great Brilliant. fact, Dan. I've yeah, got loads fact. of questions about it. Yeah, tell us more. <laughs> Who's Grace Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't um, look into Dan's fact, and sorry to peel back the curtain for a second, he's still not here live in the room, so I'm not sure exactly what happened with this story. No, I'm not either. Did you, Andy? Yeah, thankfully Tomahawk. I did. Oh, That's good, Because I went and read Alec Guinness's memoir, and oh, yeah. so it's a story he told. Basically, he was making this film called The Swan, and Grace Kelly was in it too, mm -hmm. and... Look, if you don't know who Alec Guinness and Grace Kelly are, they're two of the greats. That's all we need to say. The greatest actors ever. They're brilliant. And Alec Guinness, he, he got given this tomahawk by some Native Americans who were also involved in the filming. And it was massive. It was a kind of, it wasn't a prop, it was a proper thing. Mm -hmm. And it was really heavy and he didn't want to take it at the end of the job. So he asked a hotel porter as he was leaving, you know, going off to the next job, whatever, to slip it into Grace Kelly's bed as a kind of joke. You know, it's a mm -hmm. sort of silly thing because mm -hmm. she would have known it was his because she'd yeah, seen yeah, him yeah. get it. Mm -hmm. And then a few years after that... Uh, he came home from a performance in London. He was doing a lot of theatre at the time and he found it in his bed. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And she had found a way somehow to smuggle it into his bed. I okay. don't know if she ever told her end of the story. Oh, that's great. He waits a few more years and then he finds out that she's doing a, she's doing a project in the USA with someone who he doesn't know actually. And he gets in contact via a third party of the, I think the poet she was doing this work with. She mm. was travelling around with this poet. And he gets in contact via a third party so her companion can honestly say, no, I've never met or spoken to Alec Guinness. Mm. So he really goes to a length. And then he gets it back into her bed that way. <laughs> but wait a minute, like that does seem a bit pointless because is she going around her whole life just checking that everyone doesn't know Alec Guinness? She only hangs well, around with people who don't know Alec Guinness. After she's found it in her bed, she comes downstairs the next morning and says to the poet, you don't know Alec Guinness at all, do you? <laughs> and he can honestly say, no, I've never met Alec Guinness. Yeah, but yeah. he did, it was. And then eventually he it. goes to Hollywood in 1979 to receive an Oscar. And what does he find in his bed? <laughs> Grace Kelly. You know, he finds the tomahawk in his bed. And uh, yeah, so that was, a, that was a long running good Hollywood prank. And then one of them murdered the other with the tomahawk. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was famous, yeah. Grace Kelly died tragically. <laughs> I think she did die because I didn't read the whole story, but I like she did die. skimmed it. And she, she did die, <laughs> yeah. a and she died without it ever being acknowledged. So I think that's this really weird oh, thing that's wow. left hanging. Her and Alec yeah. Guinness never discussed. No, the they never they mentioned it to each other. This. She died in the car crash, didn't yeah. she? Yeah, I think in 19, the early eighties, yeah. and she was she was still very young. She was in, in her fifties at the time. Yeah, but yeah. she died a princess. She did. Uh, in many we... ways, we all die princesses. Mm. Oh, is that right? Uh, <laughs> in many ways, we all die a pauper because you can't take it with you. That's a really good thought. point. Well, she died in an incredibly wealthy princess. So, <laughs> um, yeah, she she was the princess of Monaco. Yeah. Some listeners will remember, maybe. she. Yeah. Some, few listeners. Um, she married Prince Rainier of Monaco. Rainier than here. Um, <laughs> it's actually a lot drier, I would suspect. In yes, Monaco, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not as rainy. Um, and she was 26, which means that her Hollywood career, a grand total of five years maximum, yeah. I believe. Yeah, she was in 11 movies, I think. Because he forced her to stop, basically. Yeah, although I think she was up for it, wasn't she? She was keen to retire. 
In fact, not, do you know why one of the explanations she gave for why she Suez. left? Suez. The Suez crisis. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't like wearing socks. Yeah, I've been wearing socks 26 years. That's long enough. <laughs> she said, um, when I first came to Hollywood five years ago, my makeup call was at 8 a.m., I'll be goddamned if I'm going to stay in the business where I have to get up <laughs> earlier and earlier and it takes longer and longer to get me in front of the camera. I think oh. saying as she gets older and older, she's going to have to come in earlier and earlier to get That's the makeup. True. That's very funny I line. see that point. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you'd empathise, James, with that a bit. Well, because the... I'm allergic to makeup, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and, you know, you like you used you to like to get, a lion. Because oh, you yeah. have to get in at 6am every day for extensive <laughs> hair and makeup before the I thought the you were talking about yesterday we did some filming and I was wearing makeup and just came out in... No. Oh, yeah, sobbing. Yeah. yeah, if you see the film, we sound cheerful, but James is streaming from his eyes. Well, that's, that's working with you, Anna. That's, um... yeah. <laughs> I blame it on the makeup, yeah. Uh, no, I think he did force us to retire because he also banned any showing of her movies in Monaco. Well, mm. I heard that, but I also heard that she was in the middle of a big contract with MGM. You know, you sign up to do seven films and all mm. that. And I think the deal, part of the deal was that she would be freed from the contract. She didn't have to make any more movies. But the wedding was filmed and broadcast to 30 million people and it was in cinemas. Yeah, 30 yeah. million people. There like were, half the population of the UK, that is, at that time. There were nearly yeah. 2,000 journalists at the wedding. Yeah, but not many, like, kings or queens of Europe were there because really? they all kind of disagreed with it because it was a royal marrying a plebeian. Oh, um, really? So, yeah, a lot of the royals got invited, but none of them went. Wow, that's interesting. Because yeah. it was a very much an arranged marriage, it seems like. As in, it was, I believe it was suggested to Arania that he find a Hollywood star to marry because they wanted to increase tourism since the war people have stopped going. That's right. And the person who suggested it, did you see that? Who? Aristotle Onassis. Mm. Oh, yes, the ship guy. The ship, Greek shipping magnate. Again, crazy name, crazy guy. Later husband of... Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy, yes. I believe his yacht had a had barstools made out of whales foreskins. That's correct. Oh, cool. So he did like he didn't have taste, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but then there were female whales were flocking to his ship. <laughs> Grace Kelly's story is very interesting because it's kind of a riches to riches story. Like she grew up really wealthy. Yes. Her father was a, a brick magnate called Jack Kelly. He was yeah, he's amazing actually. Yeah, he was an Olympic gold medalist, and her, her mother was a competitive swimmer. Grace Kelly's mum, so mm. very athletic. Be honest, the entire family were stunningly good looking. Yeah. You know, it's not surprising that she became a Hollywood star. He was a rower, wasn't he? Yeah. That's why you guys meddle in. And um, she said once, someone asked her, uh, Grace Kelly, would you write an autobiography? And she said, no, but I would like to write a biography of my father. Wow. Um, cool. And in 1920, he wanted to be in the Henley Regatta, which is a big, posh rowing competition in the UK. Uh, but he was banned because in those days, anyone who was a mechanic, artisan or labourer or works in any menial activity was not allowed to take part in the Henley Regatta. Really? Yeah. Really? Was that Absolutely. a sort of class barrier? Uh, yes, it was. But it, well, it was. Sounds yeah. like it was, as opposed to like, you don't want them to take the time off their job. Well, <laughs> what if someone's plumbing doesn't get fixed? Well, according cheating? to them, it was because they wanted it to be amateur. And if you yeah. had a job mm. as a bricklayer, then you were technically a professional. It's, it's unfair. It's, it's actually cheating to have big <laughs> muscles from your work. Only softies who've been <laughs> spent their whole lives punting so far, reading a little bit of Tennyson. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So obviously. It was class-based, but um, yeah. he was very annoyed about it. But in the same year, there was an Olympics and he won his Olympic rowing medal. And apparently he mailed his cap to King George V with a note saying, greetings from a bricklayer. Oh, nice. slam. What if that got to George V? And if George V had any idea what, who's so. this random <laughs> American brick dude? And then... Um, in 2003, the Princess Grace Kelly Challenge Cup was launched by the Royal Regatta, um, which was in memory of Grace Kelly, but also in memory of John Kelly, who right. they snubbed all those years earlier. Wow. Ah. I read he was nicknamed the most perfectly formed American male, which is quite quite an accolade mm, to have. Sexy, yeah. yeah. That is, that's, that's impressive. You know. It's because it's quite a high bar. It's not like the most well-formed <laughs> man in <laughs> 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 it's interesting isn't it becoming a princess is such an odd thing like what have you yeah. done oh i've won an oscar oh well i've secured the grimaldi succession yeah actually because mm. the current monaco prince is her son albert yeah. yeah and the reason they were so desperate to find her as you sort of allude to is that if he didn't have a son i think the monarchy would have not existed they needed right. a child they needed a son so they had to take fertility tests she had to be properly tested to check that she could have a children. She also had to have a, a virginity test, but it wasn't taken very seriously. It wasn't a. 
It can't Grace have Kelly been Grace did. Kelly. Grace Kelly did. <laughs> <laughs> and she she would absolutely have flunked that because she'd had a, a love life before, you know. She yeah, she yeah. had lots of boyfriends and things like that. Was it like a written test? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. like a driving theory test? Was it like that? <laughs> have you ever shagged anyone? <laughs> yeah, I think it was a formality rather than a, yeah. a, a, a rigidly observed thing. But, I mean, yes. still weird, you know. Gosh, yeah. Alec Guinness. No one ever gave him a virginity test, as far as I can tell. Alec Guinness? Yeah. No, as far so. as I know. No. Um, he was called Alex Stephen until he was 14. Was and then someone just said, oh, you're not called Alex Stephen, you're called Alec Guinness. Ah. Well, it was his middle name from, I think, his mum. His mother married David Daniel Stephen. Okay. And so he was given his stepfather's name mm -hmm. in day-to-day -day life. But on the birth certificate, he was actually Alec Guinness. But it was only when he was 14 that his mum just said to him, oh, by the way, that's not your name. The thing that everyone's been calling you for the last 14 years, that's what not your name. name. You know this beer that everyone likes? Yeah. Is that instead? We spoke earlier about how, Andy, we were wondering whether you would be friends with Haldane. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Whether you, it might be a bit much for you. I hate sort of all the experiments and all the cyanide. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would probably would not see him a lot socially. Well, Alec Guinness, according to the um, Dictionary of National Biography, was a stickler for punctuality and for good service in restaurants, of which he was a connoisseur. He hated change, which in his opinion was almost always for the worse. Mm -hmm. And he hated any assaults on the English language, particularly those said on the BBC. Why, why are you assuming <laughs> anything about how we would have clearly been the best of friends? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't have spoken much. Much, but we would have approved of each other's Yeah, yeah, a silent <laughs> nod in the street. Gosh, yeah. It is weird, isn't it, that the thing he hated most of all is the thing that now he's best remembered for, yeah, yeah. Mm. like most widely, you know. You can talk about the bridge on the River Kwai or you can talk about um, Kind Hearts and Coronets, but he's best remembered for Star Wars, which he thought was basically a film for children. Yeah. And which yeah. made him rich, uh, quite rich. You know, he got 2% of the... Profit. It must have been very rich, I yeah. imagine. It's a he was, bit mealy mouth, isn't it? He, he was, would always say how bad the dialogue was, and he was getting millions and millions from was, it. He, he claims he was taxed very heavily on those proceeds. So really, once it, all that was over, he got tuppence halfpenny, you know. But, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was embarrassed. Harrison Ford kept calling him Mother Superior uh, on <laughs> set. And he, he felt very old and out of touch. It was the thing that everyone really knew him for. And people started to treat him as a kind of agony aunt for it, because Obi-Wan Kenobi is a kind of wise being. I've only seen Star Wars once. I think he's like a wise man, right? I reckon he must oh be. He's a, he wears a cloak, doesn't he? Yeah, he's wise. There's no one who wears a cloak who isn't wise. No. There you go. There you go. <laughs> please write in with your examples of people who aren't. But yeah, people used to write to him and say, please, can you give me advice on this? He said, an example of a request I would typically get, he said this in an interview, is, you know, a married couple wrote to me once saying, we're having problems in our relationship. Can you come and live with us and sort them out for us, please? <laughs> oh, my God. That's a proposition, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's a bit of a... Uh, Got Schwinger vibes, hasn't it? The thing is, if you've played Hamlet, Shylock, Macbeth, you know, and then you've played Obi-Wan, you must feel a bit like you're, you've slummed it, you know, because he was one of the great classical stage actors of yeah. the 20th century. Like, he took it really, really, really seriously. He did. His art, you know, and then... Well, as many people say, not as good a stage actor as the true greats. A level below the Olivier's and the Gilgoods, according to some. Oh, wow. Dude, this is great. Oh, this is my goodness. Slam. Sick burn. Even he said, I'm really only suited to smaller parts. He was very modest, wasn't he? Wow. Okay. I did find a bad review of his stuff. It mentions, foe of the podcast, Adolf Hitler, um, <laughs> where <laughs> a film he was in called Hitler, The Last Ten Days from 1973. And the telegraph said, in Hitler, The Last Ten Days, Guinness, having discovered through his usual assiduous research that Hitler was a boring man, unfortunately succeeded brilliantly in bringing this interpretation to the <laughs> screen. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a quick quiz question. Quite a niche quiz question, maybe. But Alec Guinness played Lawrence of Arabia. In, okay. Okay. in True. what did he play Lawrence of Arabia? Oh, was it in Lawrence of Arabia? It wasn't, James. Oh. God, you've made a fool of yourself. Have I? Again? He played King Faisal in Lawrence of Arabia. But, bizarrely, two years before the film Lawrence of Arabia... Arabia <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. It's a version I accidentally watched. And I, <laughs> I can see why this shocked audience is in 1960, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's your episode title. It's so nice, isn't it? When it just. <laughs> I can't call it those things as Lawrence of Alabia. It just falls right into your lap, you know? <laughs> BBC sounds would have kittens. <laughs> okay, uh. before he starred in Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. two years earlier, he played Lawrence of Arabia in a play called Ross. 
So he, oh. he played him. And then they were casting for Lawrence of Arabia and they were said, do you wow. want to be in Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah. Wow. What a strange name for a movie about Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. Yes. Name it after that guy from Friends who put flour on his legs. <laughs> Okay, that is it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to get in touch with any of us on the show today, Andy, you can be found on... Uh, on Twitter at Andrew Hunter M. James? Uh, my Twitter is at James Harkin. You can find Dan on a stranded train somewhere uh, <laughs> or you can get in touch with all of us by emailing podcast.qi.com or tweeting at no such thing or going to Instagram no such thing as a fish or you can go to no such thing as a fish.com to find all our previous episodes or links to our tour of the world. Uh, and if you don't want to do any of that, you can just come back again next week where you'll find us here. As always, we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>